here's why we're doing this series. Let me tell you the first thing. This is exciting news. I told you I had some exciting news. And here is the first part of our exciting news is this. We have paid off our roof loan as of today. So... Now, let me tell you what that means. That means in the last 18 months, we started this 18 months ago, we paid $200,000 off without taking a single penny out of savings. Yeah, it's been amazing. Amazing. God has blessed us, and he's done it through the um, faithfulness of the church. And here's the great part. It didn't stop us from doing ministries. We've redone the children's wing while we're doing that, painted. We've done all kinds of different stuff. We continue to do ministries. And our building fund is currently at $150,000, and we're going to talk about that here in a, just a minute. But here's what we're going to do. And uh, so we had the roof loan, and uh, we are going to be done with that. Any, anytime I can use flash paper, I'm all for it. And so, love flash paper. It kind of fell farther than I expected, though. Anyway, it's all right. Roof loan is gone. Yeah, I know. That's why I held it up. I, I practiced the other day, and it almost singed my eyebrows off. But uh, it's gone. And so that is awesome. God is blessing us. We're going to continue. Now, here's the other thing. The other announcement we have is this. The reason we're starting this series is because we are over this next year, we're ca- calling it a pre-campaign. We are looking at building the next building here on campus. It was talked about years ago. That's why we have $150,000 already in savings. But our goal is this, is that it's 100% involvement for the congregation to tithe. And if everybody tithes, then we won't have to do a special campaign. God will provide the money through his people through normal giving. So this year, we are saving up so that we're drawing interest on it. And next year, we're going to begin actually having the concrete plans of the new facility. As of right now, the general idea is a facility for for students, for the community, something that we can use for large gatherings. And uh, as we're going to continue to put those plans together. But our goal is this, 100% involvement from our congregation as we all do what God has asked us to do, which is tithe. And so today, we're going to kick that series off, and we have a special guest speaker today. Our special guest speaker is uh, Rick Russo. He was the uh, pastor at LifeBridge out in Colorado, it's a mega church, and it did all kinds of community involvement. He wrote a book called The Externally Focused Church. Um, Rick currently is the president of the Spire Network. He's been the president of the North American Christian Convention in Sp- and spoken there before as well. And so today, he is going to kick off our Restore Finances um, series for us. Uh, to uh, be with you here this morning, this is the first time that I've spoken live, uh, and we've had the chance to worship uh, live. So uh, since March, we're in Colorado, uh, so enough said about that. We live in Boulder, uh, Colorado, near Boulder, 20 square miles, surrounded by reality. And uh, so we're uh, just grateful to uh, get to be with you all uh, here today. My wife Diane's here. My folks are actually in town is with us as well. And so uh, we have a place over at the lake. Uh, so we're in Lebanon a, a bunch uh, because uh, Helton's is here. So Diane's over here regularly for that. Richardson's Carpets are here. So she's here regularly. We, we shop here in Lebanon a lot. So we're glad to see you. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we're not shopping today. Yeah, one of the things that uh, I've been doing is helping pastors and churches around the globe, uh, particularly during this COVID season, navigate uh, what's going on and how do we react to this and how do we respond. And here's one thing I want to help you with and I want to invite you to do for your staff here. Uh, for Jeff and your team. I love Jeff, love his heart for the community and, and uh, for this church. And uh, uh, Jeff, when you lit that flash paper and it didn't go, I thought maybe we were going to have to get a new roof. Um, and so the... Uh, uh, but here's what I, we've surveyed 8,000 pastors over the last six months, been tracking them since March. And here's two things that are happening. Their anxiety level across the country is increasing rapidly. And, and their uh, uncertainty about exactly how to do ministry in this new season um, is a challenge. And I can't emphasize enough how big a deal that is, the, the, the hearts of our pastors around the country. It's estimated that we're going to lose uh, somewhere between 20 and 25,000 churches this year uh, across the U.S. Uh, because of all the shutdown and all the things that have happened since then. So I just want to take a moment and pray. I want to pray for your team. I want to invite you to pray. And I want to pray that God speaks into our lives as we've gathered here uh, for a few minutes today. Let's pray. Father, just thankful for your grace and the opportunity we have to gather to worship. Lord, there is so much power when we come together and worship you. 
And Lord, I'm thankful for what it does in my heart and soul. And um, Lord, I pray that uh, you'll be with the team here. And uh, Lord, for Jeff as he leads. And Lord, the opportunity in this community as people are searching and seeking in this season of uncertainty. And Father, I just thank you for uh, how you work through people and the ministry that's going on here in this place. And, and so Lord, we want to lift Jeff and his team up and just ask for your grace and strength uh, for their families Uh, For the volunteers here, for the elders here, uh, Lord, I'm so grateful for the leadership that happens through a vibrant church like this uh, to make a difference in a city. And Lord, I pray that as we've come into this place that you'd speak into my life and our lives as we hear, uh, Father, what you have to say to us through Scripture. We're just thankful for your goodness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're kicking off a money series, and uh, so it's always good to bring in a guest speaker uh, when you're going to talk about money. And uh, here's the reality. Money is a big deal issue, isn't it? Um, and it, it, it involves us actually uh, thinking about some stuff that we don't really always want to think about. I was traveling from Fort Myers, Florida, up to Cincinnati, Ohio. I was uh, on a church staff in Fort Myers, and I had just transitioned to work for a Christian university in Cincinnati, and so I was commuting for about six months, and I was on an airline called Florida Express, which has long gone out of business. They were an East Coast airline that was really cheap, like really cheap, like like Walmart less cheap like that, or a really cheap airline. And uh, in fact, if you got to the gate and they would, the pilot would ask anybody flown before, if you raised your hand, you got to sit up next to him and go through the checklist. It was, it was a cheap airline. <laughs> and I travel a lot, I fly a lot, I'm not one of those nervous flyers, and I'm on the plane and we're going down the runway and we've passed the spot where I thought we should actually leave the ground and the pilot backed off the engines and we rolled down the runway to a slow stop. And he sat at the edge of the runway, and he revved the engines up and down, up and down. It was late at night. There was no weather, uh, no traffic. And so uh, he turned the plane, and we started going the other direction down the runway. Like maybe it was downhill, get a little extra speed. And uh, this time, we we were up to almost speed when he backed off the engines, hit the air brakes, and we shuddered to a stop. Now, at that point, I knew we were not going to be able to go any further on this plane. But he sat there for several minutes, revving the engines up and down, up and down. And finally, he came on. He said, folks... We have a problem with the plane. I think, oh, hello, thank you for that announcement. Didn't see that coming. And then he said this, we're going to go back in the terminal and change aircraft because it's our policy at Florida Express. If there's something wrong with the plane, we don't fly. <laughs> I, I think that's a great policy for an airline. You know, and it is. Uh, safety first is a wonderful motto for an airline, but it's a terrible one to live by, isn't it? Because you and I are invited to take risk all the time. We take risk when we're at school. We take risk at work. We take risk in relationships. We take risk uh, in this season of, of uncertainty that's going on all over the place. There's a lot of things that are risky. And, and I didn't grow up in the church. Uh, I became a Christian when I was in high school. Uh, my parents became Christians after that. Grace changed the trajectory of our lives. And I'm so grateful for that. But here's what I know. Faith takes some risk. Grace means God's inviting me into risk. At LifeBridge, at our church, we say it this way, we want to be a safe place for you to hear a dangerous message. Because I'm grateful that God's grace uh, forgives me, that, that I get the forgiveness, but first it messes with me some. right? And, and I'm going to have to take some risk. And there is no greater place of risk, I believe, in our faith journey than when it comes to our finances. The Bible has a lot to say about money. There are, there are over several thousand verses about money, more, mo- more verses about uh, money and stuff than there are about faith or love or hope. Jesus taught 38 parables that we have recorded in the gospel. 16 of those have to do with money or things. Why? Because money gets a hammerlock on our hearts. I love what Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 4. He said, guard your heart above all else. For it is the wellspring of life. Your life flows up out of your heart. And money and stuff gets a hammerlock on us, doesn't it? It has for me. There have been plenty of times in my life when I have uh, been challenged financially. Some of those times when Dinah and I uh, could barely scrape together uh, a few nickels. When we first got married, um, you go to Wendy's now. Wendy's has the crackers behind the counter in little packages. There's a reason for that. When we first got married, all we could afford was a few bucks and we'd go out to eat 
one night a week and we went to Wendy's and we got a bowl of chili each and then went to the bin of crackers and emptied it twice. There have been times when we've had no money that money has stressed me. There have been times in our lives when we've had a lot of money, really comfortable, and money has stressed me. There have been times when I've been stingy and money has stressed me. There have been times when I've been generous and money has stressed me. Money gets a hammer lock on our hearts. And the book that uh, Jeff recommended to you is an excellent book. It talks about how you begin to get out of debt because debt's a real issue that, that beats on all of us. Money struggles are real. In fact, even today, just this week, for the first time in two decades, the thing Americans worry the most about was superseded by the coronavirus over finances. It's the first time that's happened in two decades that anything above money was our number one stressor. It's a stressor for all of us. And so I wanna look at a story Jesus tells. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 12, uh, and here's what D Jesus does. He gives a warning and then a life principle and he tells a story. So let's jump in pretty quickly. Luke chapter 12, down in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, he was walking uh, through the streets and a crowd had gathered. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter over you? Now here's the deal. It was not uncommon in Jesus' day, if there was a legal dispute going on, if there was a family dispute, a business dispute, a marriage dispute, there would be, uh, if you saw a rabbi walking down the street, you would grab him and you'd get his attention and you'd ask him to settle the deal for you. So this was not uncommon. This wasn't out of characteristic. There you see Jesus, here he's coming as the rabbi, because here's what people often need. I, I always watch this. When people would sometimes come to my office for uh, counseling, for marriage counseling, or some relationship, or some conflict they were having with a, uh, they're looking for a bigger hammer than the one they can swing themselves, right? And that's what this guy's doing. Tell my brother to give me what's mine. I need you to do what I can't get done. And here's where Jesus gives the warning. He said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. Jesus goes right to the heart of the matter, which is a matter of the heart. That greed, stuff, gets a hammer lock on our lives. Greed shows up in a lot of ways. And so Jesus is saying, hey, here's the warning. It's a flashing light going off on your dashboard. It's what the pilot's hearing. Pull up, pull up. It is that, it is that thing that happens when there's some warning bells going off. Watch out, Jesus says. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. That insidious need for more, we're never satisfied. Greed causes me to be insensitive to people. Greed causes me uh, to... to um, define my life around my stuff. Greed causes me to put God on a lower shelf than the top shelf. Greed messes with my heart and my life, and Jesus says here, watch out, be on guard. Now money issues are real, aren't they? 92% of us in America are stressed by financial matters. Less than 60% of us have more than $500 in case an emergency comes up. Over 80% of us are living paycheck to paycheck. And so money issues are real issues. And what we've been experiencing in the last six months with the disruption that's gone on, uh, with, with shutdown that's happened in various industries and businesses, there's been economic impact, there's been concern. Money issues are real issues. There were four marker moments for me when it came to money. The first was this. I think I was 10 years old. I had mowed a neighbor's yard, and they gave me $10. Now, this wasn't 10 bucks my parents had given me. This wasn't $10 I'd found on the ground. This was $10 that I'd sweated over. I mean, I'd mowed their grass. I had $10 in my grimy little paw, and it was my $10. My parents weren't going to tell me what to do with it. My friends weren't going to tell me what. It was mine. Ten bucks. I was rich. 
The second marker came for me when I was 16, had gotten a job at, a, there was a local nursing retirement center near us, and uh, I got hired uh, to, to help do some light maintenance stuff, which I was not good at, uh, but I could talk, so they eventually had me just sit down and talk to old people, which was, which was good. Get to do it sometimes still, talk to old people. When I talk to the mirror. And I got my first paycheck. And I was so excited because I knew how much I was making an hour. And I'd done the math in my head and I got my check. And I did the math in my head again because what was in my check was not what I had earned. Lived in New York. I owed them money still. I mean, they'd taken most of it away. I was like dumbfounded. They were messing with my money. The third marker happened this way. We were in our 20s. Diane and I had just gotten married. She grew up in the church. I didn't. We, uh, we were uh, uh, working with Christ and Youth. Some of you know Christ and Youth. And, and uh, there was a little church in upstate New York we were a part of and attending. And so it was Saturday night, and I'm watching Diane. We're sitting down, and she's writing a check out to the church. And I said, oh, that's good. I thought we'd just give some cash like I was used to doing. She said, no, we're writing a check. She, she wrote a check. And that check was for 10% of the check that I'd just gotten, that people had already taken stuff out of. And I said to her, we can't afford this. I mean, I, there's a lot of things I could do with that money. There was like, we, we had to pay like electric bills and our apartment rent and the car. And, and, and she said, well, this is what we do. We do? And I was in ministry at that point, all right? Young, but I'd not grown in that. Here's what I've learned. It took me a while to get there, a long while. We have never, ever been able to outgive God. Never. It's not that God's given us what we wanted. We have plenty of stress in our lives. It's not the man that, you know, when our, when our car broke down, uh, you know, stood on the corner, prayed, brought my offering in, made sure Jeff saw it and prayed over it too, and then, you know, God gave me a new car. Now, I've not yet had that happen to me, but I can tell you that, that there have been moments, crazy moments, when exactly what we needed showed up when we needed it. Never been able to outgive God. Here was the third, the fourth marker. Um, happened about um, maybe 15 years ago now. I, I had become friends with a guy who uh, started and owned Home Shopping Network. Some of you are very familiar with Home Shopping Network back in its day. And, and then he started a, a television um, called uh, Pax TV, which sold to NBC. And I was involved in helping him do some of that. And we had become friends. He'd become a Christian. Great, uh, remarkable story in his life. But it, this was in his early years. Um, he had this yacht, and he had invited three of us as pastors to come spend three days with him on his yacht and kind of invest in his life. And we did that a couple of times. We were in the country of Roatan, a little country uh, down in South America. And, and uh, we, we, a storm was coming, so we came out of the ocean and into the harbor, and we'd backed into the harbor in Roatan. And I mean, this, I have to tell you, the first time I saw this yacht, I mean, it was a yacht yacht. There were like 30 crew members, and I remember calling one of my friends, uh, Dave Stone, and I said, Dave, there's a world you and I didn't even know existed. And, and, uh, and I had my own little you know, room with a king bed, and, and the chef kept asking us what we wanted to eat, and and it was like, I have to admit, it was sucking me in. I remember sitting there thinking, I got to figure out how to get me one of these. <laughs> we're on a yacht. We're in Roatan. We're uh, sitting on the back. They had this back deck with this teak wood picnic table kind of area, really nice. And they're bringing out food, steaks and lobster and crab and burgers and hot dogs if you didn't want that, and salads and whatever we wanted to drink. And, and uh, we, were, we were eating and gorging when I heard some commotion behind me. Again, we were parked in the harbor. We were backed right up uh, into the dock. And uh, against the harbor wall, maybe from me to the clock back here, the wall back here, uh, were all these little tin huts and cardboard shacks and all these families with little kids and chickens and stuff running around. And the commotion I heard was a bunch of them had gathered around a little fire and they were grilling that paella bread kind of thing. And I had this massive display that five of us were eating. And I gotta tell you, in every one of those moments, money 
messed with my heart. In God's view, I'm money messed with me. Jesus says, watch out. Watch out for greed. Because here's what happens. We buy things we don't need from people we don't like. Do you know why you don't have an elephant in your backyard? You know, there's only one reason. No one's ever offered you one for 24 easy payments. Because otherwise, you'd, all, you'd have one in your backyard. I mean, my life would be fine if my neighbors would quit buying such nice stuff, right? Here's what Solomon says. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Watch out for greed. Watch out for greed. Because it's insidious nature. Greed takes us into what? Worry. Because we aren't going to, we don't know how to get there. We don't have enough. We're not sure how we're going to make it. Why does Jesus give this warning? Because it clutters my life. Don't measure your life by how much stuff you had. In fact, that's the life principle he gives. And he says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. I love how Peterson says this in the message. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. Your life is not just your stuff. It's not just your stuff. But that's how we keep score today, isn't it? We keep score with our stuff. What kind of car we drive, what kind of house we have, what we wear. And your life's more than that. What is it you value the most? Do this little exercise. If you had to lose something, what would you hate losing the most? What is it that gets the bulk of your attention? I'm not, I'm not talking about the stuff that you've convinced your spouse or your family about or the little bumper sticker on your refrigerator that, you know, what, what you say matters most in life. You know, you know, if you give me your checkbook and your calendar, in about two minutes, I can tell you what you care the most about. Because where you spend your time and where you spend your money, you always spend your time and your money on the stuff that matters most, no matter what else you say, no matter what other lie you convince yourself of. Give me your checkbook and your calendar, and I can tell you what your biggest value in life is. What is it we care the most about? Use stuff, love people. But most of us love stuff and use people. So then Jesus tells a story, and this is how he often would do it. He gives a warning, gives this life principle, and then he tells this very simple story. He goes on in verse uh, 16. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones and there I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be for whoever stores them things up for themselves but is not rich toward God. Very simple story. Successful farmer, he's got all he needs, he's had a great year, he needs bigger barns, and then he ends up on the night he's drawn his last breath and God calls him a fool. Look at the eye disease he had. 12 times, I, me, mine, myself, is in this passage. I know what I'll do, I know what I need, I know what I want. One of the best things I ever heard uh, about giving for me a long time ago about how I see money was this. I got asked this question, are you a bucket or are you a pipe? Because a bucket gathers stuff, collects stuff, and then when you fill the bucket, you get another bucket, and you collect more stuff, and you gather more stuff. Or are you a pipe that allows those good things to flow through you? They're, they're in your hands for a bit. They're under your control, but they're flowing through you, and others are also benefiting. This farmer was a bucket guy. Look what I've done. Look what I've got. Look what I need. Look how much I have. Now, notice what the story doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say that this is a bad guy. He doesn't say that he got his money illegally. He doesn't say that working hard and being successful is a bad thing. He's not saying that wealth is somehow a, a terrible thing. He does talk about the dangers of wealth in our lives. What he is saying is this. He's not saying this guy was harsh or mean or crooked or did injustice things to get what he had. He didn't say any of that in this story. What he's saying is this guy allowed his stuff to get a hammer lock on his life and now he's drawing his last breath and what good will all this stuff be? What good, how many buckets you have? 
By all accounts, he was successful as we define sex. His success, he had a big farm, he had a, he had a big life, he had, a, he had everything he wanted. And he was the guy that was the, like, could have been mayor in his town probably. Success. At age four, watch this progression. At age four, success is not wetting your pants. At age 12, success is having friends. At age 16, success is having a driver's license. At age 20, success is having a job. At age 35, success is having money. At age 50, success is having money. At age 60, success is having a job. At age 70, success is having a driver's license. At age 75, success is having friends. And at age 80, success is not wetting your pants. We start, we go right back to where we started, right? We just cycle back right through everything. And this guy's called a fool. He wasn't generous, he didn't share, he didn't give. The theologian Zwingli said this, if you possess something you cannot give up, you don't possess it, it possesses you. And I've been possessed by some of my possessions. They got more of me. Stuff I chased, stuff I needed, stuff I wanted. And you know how that is. Those things never, even if we get them, they never seem to fill that empty spot in our heart, do they? They never seem to take that, that, that place that we keep trying to chase after so that we have value, we have worth, that we're cared for, that we'll have the people, we have status, that people know that we're a somebody. We keep score with our stuff. And Jesus says, watch out. Because one day, one day, you are going to draw your last breath. And this guy did not have an exit strategy. And here he is. And Jesus says, now what are you going to do? Because all that stuff, all that stuff isn't going to buy you any time in eternity with God the Father. Are you a bucket or are you a pipe? And the antidote to greed is generosity. And it took me a long time personally to learn this. The Old Testament for giving was 10%. Here's what we read, and I'm sure Jeff will hit this passage again with you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. I'm like, it's the only place in the Bible where God invites his people to test him. Test me in this. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not room enough to store it. And so 10%. So what does 10% mean? A tithe was simply 10% of what they had. So if I have $100, how much of that is God's? Ah, yeah, see, you're way better than the people in Colorado. <laughs> they would have done the math and said 10 bucks. <laughs> All of it is God's. I'm a steward of that, and God says to me, I want you to trust me, and I want you to give 10% of that back, because I want to know I got your heart. I, I want to know that, that your stuff doesn't have a hammer lock on your heart. And the Old Testament model isn't about 10%. It's actually about being more generous. Everything in the New Testament was more than. God's grace was more than. Uh, giving seemed to be more than. How they were expected to, to, to be engaged in each other's lives was more than. Paul says this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly is going to reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously is going to reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And he's able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, you'll have all that you need and you'll abound in every good work. Are you a bucket or are you a pipe? Are you just hoarding, collecting? Or are you allowing what God blesses you with to flow through you? And what I've discovered in my life is that the more generous we've become, the more God seems to increase the capacity. But every time I've circled back to a bucket mentality, spigot seems to get shut down for me. Are you a bucket or are you a pipe? And then Jesus goes on to finish 
this story, and I'm just going to read the scripture, and then we'll close in prayer. He said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. What you'll eat, or about your body, what you're going to wear, for life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them, and how much more valuable are you than the birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? And since you can't do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, of, yo, you of little faith? And don't set your heart on what you'll eat or drink. Don't worry about it, for the world runs after all these things, and your Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you. And then he ends simply saying, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Giving, generosity, isn't about the dollars. It's about our hearts. Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Let's pray together.